Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the pre-made Dominate Risen Esports Week 8. We've got an action-packed game for you set up today, and we're going to be heading in very soon, but it's going to be between Pawn Sacrifice Black and OSU Scarlet. These teams are both 4-3, and three, and I'm sure it will be a very close match, as they've shown so far in this regular split. They're just about even. My name is Terrain. I'll be doing play-by-play -play for you today. And on my side, even though there isn't exactly a side since we're not using cameras right now, it's going to be Mr. Gold for Inter. How are you doing today? I'm doing, I'm doing good. Um, a little bit tired, still waking up, I'm not going to lie. Also, for some reason, my throat kind of hurts. Either way, though, we are hopping into Champion Select here. And we're already seeing the Jex. Yeah, the Jax and the Thresh taken off the board here, potentially, Terrain. And Jax and Thresh, I feel like Thresh is the more common ban. Something that's a little bit more uh, consistently in the meta, as Thresh, everybody knows him at this point. The Mr. Peel and Pick himself offers just about everything that you want from a support. Whereas Jax seems to be more targeted at someone from Pawn Sacrifice Black. We're getting pretty much a reversal around now where Udyr, another meta champion, commonly picked. Everybody can play him because he's just run at you, slap you, and do some damage, farm real fast. Whereas Diana is going to be more of a target uh, ban as well. Mm -hmm. And I believe that Nunu ban is also a target towards Biogamer there on the side of OSU. Um, Hecram also one of Bio Gamer's most played. However, though, due to Hecram's prominence and the fact that Udyr is already banned, you can see why OSU is considering and locking in that ban there. So you don't hand. Well, okay, the Udyr Hecram is a very typical handshake, but when one of them's away, well, you don't want to be giving over to that other powerhouse struggle pick to the other side. So let's see what um, the side of Pawn wants to pick up here for their first pick. I mean, when you take away both the Udyr and the Hecarim, it leaves just a few options left as those top meta junglers. There's still a Grave, still a Volley Bear, still Lilia, Skarner. There are plenty of other options after you ban those two picks, and their power has also been knocked down so that some of those other options, especially the Volley Bear right now, have a lot more presence and can really compete with Udyr or Hecarim. Tristana as well for Pawn Sacrifice Black is a nice flex pick. It can go mid, top, or AD carry, although less likely top. Uh, Volley Bear as well can be flexed between top and jungle, so I'm liking both these teams' first picks. And soon enough, we're also going to be getting a second pick, probably somewhere like a support, I would say, for uh, OSU. It's... Or AD carry, that also works. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be the Jinx here for Shrimp Templar, assuming that does get locked in. Um, and it does get locked in, so that is interesting since you do already see the Tristana here terrain. That Tristana can be paired up with a very aggressive support and really effectively shut down this Jinx in the lane. If you do send the Tristana bot with, say, a Nautilus or a Leona, you can really put that pressure onto the Jinx level 2. And especially since that Jinx does not have the Thresh for lane safety, it does, of course, make this Jinx very vulnerable. Lilia, though, gonna be picked up here at the Tristana. I'm curious to see if Pawn Sacrifice wants to finish off their bot lane here before going into the next round of bans. I'm still not sure if the Tristana is going to be in the bot lane. If they get a support that works really well, like an Alistar, I could definitely see it being uh, the bot lane Tristana, but there's still an option for it to be a flex pick. They could still be using this as a flex to go mid, Although I, I would kind of expect it to go bot at this point. Getting that Alistar early on is going to be excellent at pushing away anybody who tries to get onto that... Uh, sorry, not... I was reading in the opposite order. It's going to be excellent at creating engages, not pushing away people to peel for a Jinx. That's what I was about to say, but it's on the opposite side. It'll be great to gap close, get the Jinx down very fast, as well as Victor, somewhat immobile and unable to escape from a powerful gap closing gauge from Alistar and Tristana. But I do think it's pretty interesting that they uh, drafted that pretty hard engage with Alilia. She's not the champion that you would always see diving in. Uh, you tend to rush the Zhonyas on her, flash in, get a swirl seed down, and just sleep in Zhonyas. That's all you do, and it's Alilia to start out a fight. And 
I kind of expected something a little bit more of a hard engage for Pawn Sacrifice Black to work with Alistar, but Lilia, she can still find her place in the team. Yeah, I mean, the Lilia can follow up on any Alistar engages that do happen very well. If everybody is knocked up in the air with that headbutt pulverized combo, that makes it a lot easier to land your uh, Lilting Lullaby onto multiple members. And we are heading into the second part of the band here. The Yone going to be taken away, I believe. Totemax on the side of Haunt's Sacrifice does play that quite a bit in the mid lane alongside a bunch of other AD carry mid laners. Um, or sorry, AD mid laners in general, not just the AD carries. And yeah, don't know where he's going with that. But hey, I'm transitioning to you now, Turian. Amazing. I think it's good to take away those AD mid laners, the aggressive picks that can really just advance onto a victor. But at the same time, I'm not sure if it's entirely necessary. You can ban away top lane, get a super uh, favorable top lane matchup. You already drafted your victor, and there aren't too many super dedicated counters. And on top of that, I'm not sure if Lucian specifically is very good into the victor. Later in the game, victor is just going to completely outscale him. Victor's also pretty safe at farming. He can clear the wave super fast to just make sure the wave never gets pushed in. And I think one of the most notable counters that I know for a fact that Pawn Sacrifice uh, Black's mid laner plays is actually Zed. It's not exactly the most meta pick right now, but if you're going to draft a counter and if you're going to uh, ban out potential counters that the enemy team mid laner does play, just get rid of the thing that's strongest into your team. So I do think Yone and Lucian are still solid bans. I'm not sure if they would have been the best picks uh, for Pawn Sacrifice Black. I think they might want to play something that's a little bit safer, but we could see even at this point, if the Tristana is the flex, yep, there's the Zed. Yep, so that more or less confirms that it is going to be that bot lane Tristana there. A lot of attack damage already for the side of Pawn Sacrifice. You do have the Lilia, thankfully, to bring a bunch of magic damage, and I wonder how they're going to want to round up the comp here, if they're going to try and opt for a much more beefier top lane here. Or if they're going to just try and go all in on this damage aspect of their comp, they still don't know what the enemy top laner is because Volibear can be flexed between top and jungle. Really great there of OSU to keep that in the dark, but Renekton's going to be the pick here. Definitely a nice blind pick. Can be countered, however, though. Now, what are some counters that you expect to see here? Because OSU, Scarlet, likes split pushers. I am not sure about the Renekton as a, a team that plays split pusher, or sorry, a Cho'Gath for a team that plays split pushers. But um, it's still a pretty good pick just to have an even tankier lineup. I, I'm not sure if that's kind of what you were expecting. Hmm. Who knows? Um, the Cho'Gath is definitely going to be very strong because due to the fact that the Renekton, Zed, Alistar, and then also Tristana, Lilia, just to not as much of a degree, they all have to jump into you, and if they jump into that giant AoE two and a half second silence that Shogun has, then that is really going to screw them over quite a bit in team fights. because if you go in, you're not able to use the Renekton Slice and Dice or the Renekton Colvin move to really just hammer away at this Jinx and Victor. It's going to really decrease the damage you output, and same goes for Zed and Alistair, more or less. So it is a nice pick. Of course, there can be some vulnerabilities to this Cho'Gath if the Renekton's able to get the one up during the laning phase, because the Cho'Gath, a little bit squishier and on, definitely vulnerable, can be picked off in some well-timed trades, or even if this Lilia decides to visit up top lane here for Pawn Sacrifice. There is one thing I do want to talk about here. The very low chance of this happening, but I would love to see it as a potential play from OSU. Send the Cho'Gath against the Zed. Have Victor against uh, Renekton, because Victor can just very easily clear the wave from Renekton and keep a distance, so you can't really abuse that Bruiser pick. And Cho'Gath is historyed as one of the strongest counters to Zed in the history of League of Legends. I'm not yeah. sure if you watched back in the day of like, Maybe it was spring 2015, but in LCS, it was Cloud9 versus TSM in the finals, and Bjergsen picked AP Cho'Gath into High's Zed, and it was the most one-sided finals in LCS history. I have never seen a, a Zed get shut down harder than 
Cho'Gath into Zed. So I think this is just a potential way for them to play. I kind of doubt it's going to happen because pulling out those flexes in a game like this can tend to be kind of risky, especially if possibly your players don't have that sort of diverse champion pool to just pick up a very strange counter like Cho'Gath into Zed. Yeah, um, that's something we'll end up seeing just where this Cho'Gath does end up going There's once we have the champions wise. like much more confirmed here. Uh, the teams are kind of taking a little bit of extra time, it feels like, with these pick and bans, even though they have already locked them in. Like you said, most likely going to be the Cho'Gath top with that Victor mid. And Victor top hasn't really been too much of a thing for a while, not since um, it was kind of heavily nerfed a few seasons back. Either way, though, OSUs definitely have some very nice tools to deal with the all-in potential that is coming out upon sacrifice and that could be an issue here if you're having to go through all the cc from the cho'gath nautilus and Bolibear to try and get on top of this jinx and victor yeah at this point we can actually just see that it's the top lane cho'gath so it's what you said it will just be the silence to prevent renekton from being able to do all too much lane as far as aggressive plays on top of that cho'gath's passive really helps out into bruiser matchups because you can very easily just sustain back up from farming under turret Whenever he kills a minion, he gets some mana and health back. And it's a lot more than most people expect. Uh, and it's a lot more than most people would really love to deal with if you're our Renekton. Because imagine you just use all your combo, you E and get an auto attack, use the reset with the slice and dice, and then use a Q. And then Cho'Gath takes a wave and it's nullified. It's, mm -hmm. It just isn't a very fun uh, thing for bruisers to have to deal with. Yeah. Although, I don't think, outside of legit SAC looking towards that top lane for a gank, or maybe Biogamer looking towards that top lane for a gank, I feel like we're going to be more so focused on the mid and bot lanes here, Terrain, since, of course, mid lane, we do have the Assassin into Control Mage matchup. We're going to be curious to see how Totem Max 9 is able to bully around this victor in the lane, because Zed can exert a lot of kill pressure onto that victor but if you're not able to kill that victor and you're standing on top of gravity field that is a world of hurt and we touched on it earlier of course but the aggressiveness of the tristan elster bot lane might be con some concern here for the osu bot lane now a lot of people see control mage into a sash so like says it's just going to get poked out of lane but then once he hits six he's just going to be able to press you want to know how you make the early game really easy for a Zed into a control mage? You build You're Dorn important. Shield into Hex Drinker, and then do whatever you want after that. You will never die to that victor. Absolutely never. His poke is not going to matter at all. You take zero damage, he has no kill pressure. When you're dealing with a Volibear and Cho'Gath, who also offer a lot of magic damage uh, as potential roam threats to mid lane, just having that extra bit of... Uh, defensive stats doesn't actually really negate uh, from Zed's damage all that much. It makes him much more survivable. So I love to see Totem Max actually end up going for that. But m most Zed players just like, oh, mythic item. I must get mythic item and do damage. Roam bot lane and get kills. I think mm -hmm. that uh, OSU is going to be smart enough to at least somewhat avoid that. But everything said, we are going to avoid speaking for a little bit as we're going to head to a quick break before we get into the game. We're waiting on the spectator delay, so it'll just be a couple minutes and then we'll have some nice League of Legends action for you. Just a second. See you then.
Hello everybody and welcome back. We are into game with Pawn Sacrifice Black versus OSU Scarlet. Game one of those best of three series. Yep, and uh, very aggressive level one coming out. Okay. Yeah, that's one way for aggression. It is going to cost a flash from Fluxetine though, so... Just kind of using that without uh, getting anything in return. Does mean... Sheer will and legit gonna be able to drop that ward onto the enemy red buff. See if there's any response coming up from OSU in terms of early warding. It does not look like it due to the um, fan out control. I'm honestly kind of surprised that they chose to go for the buff directly onto red and not spotting the uh, entrance by that bush in the raptor camp. Because there's a good chance that they'll lose out on some information just in between those two places. If they okay, <laughs> I love to see the flash there. But it if they have the ward by the raptors, then they'll be be able to get the information a little bit earlier to see if uh, BioGamer takes the raptors before the red, or just to see if BioGamer starts on the top side of the map taking raptors into red buff. Like th there's just a little bit more to offer by placing the uh, ward by the raptors, but. In the end, it's not actually going to matter all that much. It's not going to get them all too much information regardless. As Biogamer has started the bot side, legit doing the opposite. Likely not going to see any uh, vertical jungling though. Probably not. Um, might see a little bit of contestion over Scuttles if there's a bit of change up in the having, but it's not something we'll really know about for another two-ish minutes when those scuttles do spawn. It does mean, though, that the lanes are going to be kind of on their own for a bit here. And most interestingly, yeah, keep an eye on the bot lane here. See if Shrimp Temper and Daddy Zillion are able to get that level 2 first. Or if Hunt for Value and Flexitine will be able to hit their level 2 power spike first. Because it's going to be a big deal as it is going to be going over to the Pawn Sacrifice bot lane here. Yeah, Pawn Sacrifice, getting it first, but they don't really have that level 2 spike in a place where they can make a play. So, while they do have the spike, both teams are now level 2, both teams will be able to fight. While it will be better for that more or less hard engage from Pawn Sacrifice Black, uh, based on the wave state, they probably won't go for anything. This is just going to be a trade in damage. Daddy Zilly doesn't have to worry about falling quite yet in this game. Like, these bot lanes do not have all that much kill pressure very early on. Maybe if they have a level advantage, but that just won't be the case. Both these guys are just going to be farming up, and junglers are more or less nowhere to be seen for that gank. That being said, on the top side, Biogamer was looking for a potential angle onto Sheer Will. It ends up just going for the scuttle. Didn't get the angle for a gank, so back to farming we go. So now the jungler going to really meet here. I don't believe Biogamer was spotted in that top lane either. So there is a little bit of mystery here on the pawn sacrifice side about where this big old bear is. Go to Max. You can just walk through, uh, walk through Tribush Ward. Yeah, I can. I'll give him some info. You have this Lily here for legit in the bot lane. I don't think there's going to be too much of it unless Daddy Zillion wants to like go for this flash play. But legit, Zach doesn't really have the damage right now. And Shrimp Tempora jumping in might just leave him open to a world hurt. The wave, if Shrimp Temper just didn't fire that auto attack or that second auto attack right there, it would have been slow pushing towards blue side. But they don't really have any opportunity anymore to really go for a gank. Let the uh, push go in and just open up uh, Lilia to potentially look for something. Since she goes for a reset to get the top side, get her level six a little bit faster. You can see both these lanes are likely just going to try to push out as fast as possible and get an early reset, so they have those items. But Fluxetine looks for a hook, gets some damage onto Daddy Zillion. But again, not enough damage in the bot lane quite yet. You need a jungler to get a kill. Yeah, or have Hunt for Value hit that level six point, so you have that super mega death rocket as Alstar. Kind of naturally very tanky. These hooks are adding up though, never mind that he's can't get the top side. Drago Phoenix takes a bunch of damage and he doesn't have an opportunity to really walk away anywhere. Does have the flash, but not enough health to really make it worth it. First blood over to Sheer Will. It's on the opposite side of the map, it's being punished. 
And that is a nice pickup there in the top lane since the Renekton is, of course, very um, happy to get early game advantages to help dictate the pace of the lane, especially since Sheer Will. Oh, never mind that. That's good hook. Good hook, but a teleport burn from Sheer Will will decentivize any sort of fight happening for OSU right now. They're just going back away, take the dragon, and take their win where they got it. And it's back to more or less a neutral game with these laners getting back to their lanes. And that is a good pickup there. You get the dragon, you almost get that kill there into Daddy's alien. Of course, he's able to flash out. And forcing the teleport from sheer will is actually kind of a big deal because it means, once again, Drago Phoenix able to go back up to this top lane, get that massive gold or CS lead, get a nice free cheater recall here as his whip crashes into the turret. And these top laners should be more or less pretty even in terms of gold. If we take a look at the gold here, it's actually, yeah, quite literally dead even, just yep. give or take the single CS. Yeah, 10 gold. Not going to make a difference in the grand scheme of things. Even though there was a kill for sure, Will, just because he did that teleport down, he lost out on so much late uh, minions and so much XP. So this will actually be a very good place for Drago Phoenix to have an opportunity to get back in. Biogamer as well. Not sure. He did get the Scuttle Crab right there. So on top of that, Volibear is also going to be a little bit of XP ahead of Legit Sack. Yeah, a small advantage might come into play if they go for a gank and Biogamer happens to be level 6, whereas Legit isn't. Probably not going to be the case, but something to definitely consider as, once again, everybody on the map has calmed down and we've gone to a state of relative serenity here. I do feel like we will see some action here in about a minute or two, though. You can see the pings on the top side for OSU. They said, okay, we know Lilia still has to clear blue we know she still has to clear her and go up that's her level six we have the nautilus in the top side if we take a fight right now we will have a little tiny bit of an advantage because that lilia doesn't have the mana sustain she was low on mana it was spotted by the uh scuttle crab earlier so they had the pings out they had the notice but they decide okay we don't have lane prio mid we don't quite have lane prio top yet we should just leave this astray and look for a play elsewhere on the map so you can see them positioning towards bot. They want to try to get this Jinx uh, ahead. They want to try to get this Jinx scaling a lot faster. And on top of that, make sure the Victor is able to clear these waves and uh, survive against the Zed. So once we get those neutral objectives up and as options, it will be a play for either team. Yep, and especially now with this first back coming in for Tugamax and Zed, you can see, oh, never mind, that's once again a hook. Hook on to Daddy Zillion, not the target you want to get, but he's already falling super low on health, and there is a Mega, de rock. mega Death Rocket able to be used. Very low health is Daddy Zillion, but the hunt for value can't get quite around. Lily has joined the fight, but Shrimp to Pure is very low. The first kill over, second oh. with the Super Mega Death Rocket. Legit sack to look for some back. He is going to get one, likely be the second, and a double kill for himself. In the end, an even trade. But technically, it's even in terms of kills and in terms of gold, but we have to look at where the gold went, because the hunt for value on Jinx can become such an absolute menace if accelerated, and getting two kills early on like this is definitely one hell of a way to get accelerated. Gonna put um, Hunt for Value pretty close to that Mythic Power Spike, actually, as these top players are going at it. This Dominance is available. scary, for sure, Will. He was taking that aggressive play, but the support had roamed off mid. Now mid, we got a little bit of a fight. Not enough damage oh. from the victor, but the death mark to secure it for Totem Max. Nice little 1v1 there from the Zed. Oh, and the... Barrier for Providence Knox timing out right before that death mark pop came in. And that is going to be a scary precedent for this mid lane because now Providence Knox doesn't have that flash, won't have that barrier in. Totemax, being that mobile assassin, will have that ignite back up earlier and will potentially be able to look for a repeat on this as bot lane is going to be getting hammered in. Probably hammered in and a couple turret plates going over to Shrimp Tempura should slightly negate the gold lead that Jinx has. Uh, she's sitting about 100 up, so thanks to getting 
roughly 200, 300 gold from the turret plates. We'll be roughly even in the bot lane for a little bit longer. And if OSU can get a little bit more pressure, or maybe even some kills from a team fight around the dragon that just came up, they could get the Jinx scaling even faster. They do have perhaps a better team fight. It's kind of hard to tell, but a pick potentially in the mid lane would definitely make them have a team fight advantage. Providence Knox has no barrier available, but he also Wait, has just out. enough health. Daddy Zillion ends up being the one falling. Took a one too many tower shots and one kill for none. Goes over to red team. We're yep. to try to find some more plates though. Good pop there, Totemax. Yeah, took a fight against a bear who still had an ultimate up. That definitely isn't going to go in his favor. And now that that mid laner is gone and Providence Knox has respawned, be back to having dragon priority for the red team. That was just not a good time for Totemax to die. Uh, yeah, slightly Pega. See if Legit's able to get this. Nope, not going to be able to get that Miracle Steel in. The objectives going to be going so far mostly in the favor of OSU here. Um, of course, still a dead even game in most respects. The biggest scariest points, however, though, are if you weren't able to kill that Victor off that dive, then in fact Providence Nox even got an assist off of that, so rewarded for you committing three people to that mid lane is a little bit sus. A little sus, and there was roughly a thousand gold lead earlier for Pawn Sacrifice Black, but it's already been closed up, mostly due to that mid lane fight, and perhaps they could be looking for something to get back that gold lead now is they get the headbutt onto Fluxatine. The teleport is here to try to fall back up, but I'm afraid that's going to be a little bit too far in for Drago Phoenix. There are four members here and you don't have any backup. This Cho'Gath is surely to fall and two kills go over to Pawn Sacrifice Black. That teleport from Drago Phoenix just coming in what felt like a few seconds too late there. By the time that Cho'Gath arrives there to rain, I mean, there's already a dead Nautilus. It's going to result in even more plates going over to this Tristana, who now has kills under their belt. And uh, that's going to be given over a bit of a gold lead to this Tristana. Of course, fairly even, thanks to how even the farm is and those two kills from earlier on this Jinx. Uh, oh, no, plus. Aww. Ah, he's just going to walk out of there. He's okay. Totemax might not be all too right, though. Does get ported out, back cancelled, does have a shadow get over a wall in just a second. It's going to get stunned up, it's going to be hard for him to get out now, uses the death mark, doesn't get away with quite anything. Biogamer fell very low on health, but not quite enough to trade back the kill. And... So tragic that um, Shadow was not available quite yet for Max to hop over that wall, ultimately cost the Zed their life terrain, and... That's just giving over another free kill to the enemy team. Sure, it goes over to Biogamer as this Volibear, who isn't gonna be like converting all of that into just pure damage to melt your team, but it's gonna be converted into that very tanky sort of big old bear on the front line. And when you have this very damage focused comp, you don't want the opponents getting any tankier than they already have to. And with this finished turbo chem tank, uh, that's kind of tankier than this Volibear should probably be at this point. Yeah, three kills under his belt. It's not exactly the member that you want the kills on, but it's definitely a member that you'll take the kills on. Having a tank skill up super early on that also gives a bunch of early base damage will help out a lot in early game skirmishes like this one Biogamer engaging onto a million, not quite able to find something in the bot lane though, sheer will. It's going to take that super mega death rocket, just enough damage to find the kill over to the hunt for value. And this Jinx is getting very scary. Yep. Thanks to Flux being able to just keep that crocodile CC'd for what seemed like an eternity and then all the true damage from that Kraken Slayer, from that Ignite, really just shredding through sheer will. Gonna be giving this Jinx another kill. It does mean though in the top lane that Drago Phoenix is gonna be having a fight for themselves against the bot lane. Robin is not, might just good. die. Oh, the fade away shuriken. Yep, clean 1v1. And some I'm going off that kill. Okay, we tried, we did the thing. 
Yeah, he did the thing, but that's unfortunate <laughs> for Robin and Snox since that is the second time they have been solo killed this game by that Zed, and it's only gonna get worse from here on out. Like when we're talking about side lane situations, if these two meet in the side lane, that is going to be a nightmare for Robin and Snox. What's the team? Let's talk into the Lilia. There's an Alistar over the wall, and we might see a bit of a big old fight break out here. Or we might see everybody just kind of see each other and say, mm, maybe not for me. Yeah, I I think they're just going to look to reset on the side of Pawn Sacrifice Black. They've got gold available to spend. There are two neutral objectives that are about to be up, but not up soon enough where backing will get them late to it. The... Once they spend this gold, they'll effectively have their gold lead. They hadn't backed in so long. There was a thousand gold on three members that they're working at an effective gold deficit at that point. And now with that back, they're going to be playing with that 1,000 gold lead. They are going to be a little bit late to getting the ward control over the dragon, which seems to be the objective of choice for both these teams. But it's really going to come down to the team fighting potential. And just looking at the positioning of these two teams, the hunt for value is so far away from his front line that he will not be able to enter the fight without potentially sacrificing himself to toe to max. So this is actually a really bad team fight for the red team as the engages here, the pulverize onto two, as both the members get knocked down by Shrimp Tempura. Soon to be another as Drago Phoenix does flash over the wall and manages to escape. But there still will be the dragon to pawn sacrifice black. And a beautiful pick out there, knowing that the hunt for value was nowhere near their own team, not able to participate whatsoever to get those instant double picks off the head, but Paul Fries into the Lilting Lullaby into Shrimp Tempura, just blowing them all up with that explosive shot. That is now gonna be putting the side of Pawn Sacrifice on the board for Dragons and deny the near soul point for OSU. The near soul point gets denied for OSU. But this could be the scaling of getting a ton of ocean drakes for pawn sacrifice black. A lot of teams will sacrifice the first two dragons to get control over the rift herald and plates in the side lanes so they can get that gold lead early on and not really waste their time on the stats that won't scale up quite as much on the dragons. It really goes into just the play style of a team for uh, them to choose. Okay, we want gold over dragon value. You can see that Pawn Sacrifice Black just wanted to get their gold onto members like the Tristana and the Renekton. Make sure that they're winning on both the side lanes, get their carries in a front line in a good place to be able to take over these team fights. That's exactly where it's heading. That team fight was super one-sided. Maybe it could go a little bit less one-sided next time if Jinx positions correctly, but it's yeah. still really difficult. Because I feel like that wasn't the most even fight when you consider it was five versus four and the one person on the enemy team missing was one of their two big damage dealers. So yeah, maybe we'll see something value. a little bit more even next time. There is a next time as there's the dredge line. Go to Max, getting knocked up, is going to have a little bit of fancy feet to trick around. I believe he had a shadow. Yes, it will be the death mark shadow to oh. just trick shot away from there and Fluxstein isn't quite able to get the lockdown. Nice escape there from Totem X. And that is one of the hard things about trying to pin down the Zed because he just ults you, runs away, and you have to play the game of does he keep going that way or does he go back to his shadow? I would have liked if Fluxstein had hang hung back more so for that retrace to the shadow because you had team elsewhere on the map that could have collapsed as Draco Phoenix might be in some danger here as there are three members. There's the Lilting yeah. Lullaby. Lilting Lullaby sucks this up. That's a lot of CC with the Pulverize added on. And Draco Phoenix, no flash available. Surely get taken down. But the more important part of this is they have the Rift Herald to try to secure this turret. Pop that three members standing. They're going to be answered back by another three as Totemax is on the wing, keeping the Volley Bear busy. But it's still going to just be the walk away they don't want to do too aggressive to play here. That is two, or sorry, one kill picked up for free in the top lane. They're also able to get that mid lane outer turret. And now the objective is very handily swinging in the favor of Pawn Sacrifice here, Terrain. And a lot of it, I feel like, is going to be built off the side lane pressure that Totemax has been putting down. We've seen the potential for this set to 1v1. The Victor, who doesn't even have the Seeker's Arm Guard quite yet, which is 
quite a yikers. And the two level difference is just gonna make this matchup that much more of a nightmare if you happen to be Providence Knox. I mean, at this point, the matchup of Victor versus Zed isn't as big of a concern just in terms of the 1v1. At this point, a lot more of the fights that we're seeing are going to be based on skirmishes or team fights. Laning phase is pretty much over, especially when half, if not all the lanes actually for uh, OSU have already been broken in. There are no more outer turrets. So the carries are just going to have an opportunity to farm a little bit more safely. They won't have as much pressure around those neutral objectives, but you can see that the hunt for value just going to pick up waves in the mid lane that are pushed a little bit beyond uh, a safe extension. And with that being said, there can still be leads gained here from the blue team. They might not have the waves in good places all over the place, but they can start getting those Ocean Drakes stacking up. The next one will be up in just about 40 seconds. They're getting the vision control already. Mm -hmm. And one thing to note here is that both the AD carries for both teams have hit the big two item spike here. They both have their mythic, they both have their follow up item, and they both can do a lot of damage. It's just going to be a matter of which one gets to survive the longest in these fights, because you know both this Tristana and this Jinx terrain are going to be having big old targets on top of their heads going into what I can assume is going to be a fight here in just a little bit. Yeah, big thing to take a note is Runan's Hurricane does do a lot of damage as the team is clumped up, but I'm not sure the blue team will be clumped up here. It's just going to be it's set totem for the hunt for value immediately annihilated by Totemax. The death mark is on Fosbus Knox, the second kill confirmed. Those are the carries down from OSU in just a complete sweep of a team fight. Sure, there are two members left standing, but Flux team is also secured. The complete opening on the dragon for this team to make some plays, get some objectives from that fight. And a beautiful flank there by Totemex to show the restraint and patience to just wait in that bush, just keep waiting, keep waiting, keep waiting, keep waiting, until the perfect opportunity presented itself. He didn't even need the death mark ultimate to finish off Hunt for Value. He nearly killed Hunt for Value with the first Q E combo, and then was just able to finish him off after he death marked Providence Knox. That's gonna mean two Ocean Dragons. That means the Baron going over. A very definitive gold lead now, and what should blow this game wide, wide open in favor of Pawn Sacrifice here, Terrain. Just occurred in front of our eyes, and it's probably going to lead to the end of the game here in just a short bit, I want to say. Yeah, go for you know, It's really looking to be a one-sided late game for Pawn Sacrifice Black. That was such a decisive team fight, and Totemax put in so much work to get the first kills early on. But you can't really sleep on Legit Sack. He got an enormous amount of damage off in that fight, thanks to just being able to uh, get those swirl seeds off across the entire team, and as well get the little thing lullaby onto everybody that was still available to even be killed at that point. Like, yeah. <laughs> the Lily is just such an impactful member of this team, and you can just see it in terms of the scoreline. She has the highest kill participation on the team. She's got the highest, well, eh, I guess not the highest bounty, but she's just doing all that much work to make these team fights so much easier and get this objective control. Love to hear the communication on the end of Pawn Sacrifice Black because it seems like the team is really relying on the lot a lot of the positioning from Legit Sack to make these uh, leads happen. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at this point, they have quite the massive lead that they have a lot of lead in how they approach these fights. Oh my god, Drago Phoenix able to take a lot of punishment from the Zed, but since Totemax still off those two levels has those two items complete, most notably having all that extra percentage armor pin against this armor stacking Cho'Gath. He is gonna hurt and is gonna take down this Cho'Gath eventually as the rest of Pawn Star just, or sorry, Pawn Sacrifice gonna be marching their way on up and oh, oh my lord, Shirelda's grudge with the damage for Toda Max absolutely deleting the opposing AD carry as the rest of his team joins the fight, annihilating Providence Knox, soon to be the rest of his team as well. 
as that third kill goes over Drago Phoenix, the last man under the turret falls to Tota Max with the turret as well, falling in his wake. Inhibitor soon as well. With this Baron still available, minions in the base. I think this will just be game one. Going over to Pawn Sacrifice Black. Bar some sort of astronomical mishap. This should be a game one Pawn Sacrifice dub here. Next is gonna be under fire. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, there, there was a little bit of an astronomical throw almost. They nearly lost multiple members to the base, but even then, can't kill everybody. Pawn Sacrifice Black is going to take game one in dominant fashion off the back of some really stellar AD carry plays, and not just referring to the AD carry of Shrimp Tempura, but also Totemax being super strong in team fights. Mm -hmm. And honestly, OSU, they're going to have to find a way this game, I feel, to deal with that sort of aggression because we have saw time and time again in that last game there, Terrain, that all of Pawn Sacrifice would just jump in and completely clean up fights, just destroy the back line and win the fight off the back of that. And if you're not able to handle that or keep an eye out for those potential flanks that we saw time and time again from uh, our good friend in the mid lane, then it's going to be a hard road ahead for sure if you happen to be OSU. Yeah, OSU is going to need to rethink a little bit of their draft going into the next game. But before we head into that next game, we're going to go to a quick break to get these teams some time to communicate their differentiating strategies for us to get some water. So we'll see you in just a second for game two.
Welcome back, everybody, to game two of the pre-made dominant week eight matchup between Pawn Sacrifice Black and OSU Scarlet. We just saw a tragic game one for OSU Scarlet as they lost out in just about every mid to late game fight for Pawn Sacrifice Black to go up 1-0 in this best of three series. But Goferino, what do you think we might see in terms of changes for this draft? We had to into it very soon. Um, I want to see OSU draft more ways to deal with the raw aggression we saw from Pawn Sacrifice last game here, Terrain, because it felt like even with all the protection they had for their back line, time and time again in every fight, everybody would just run past their front line and just hop onto the back line and blow up that Jinx and Victor. So hopefully something different this time around that can better handle that sort of aggression is what I mostly want to see. And do you think they might change up their uh, bands a little bit to uh, maybe take away Zed? Because that Zed put in some serious work and they weren't really ready to position for it. Potentially, yeah. Um, we'll have to see since it definitely is something you can take away, but it was also a counter pick we saw into that Victor. We're able to score a few solo kills last game even too. I feel like uh, it's a potential, yeah, but... <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah. Yep, we're heading in I champ do. select, and uh, OSU has uh, voiced their opinion on that uh, talk, and they're hovering that Zed ban. Love to see what other bans they might do. I, I would love to see if they choose to take away something like a Tristana, with it being able to be a good flex pick. But, yep, that Zed ban is going to be confirmed. Now it's on to Pale and Sacrifice Black, the winning team from last game, to see. Do they want to change up their strat at all? The answer, so far at least, is no. Nope. Uh, nothing too much to change, except for the fact they are on red side, so some things you might have been able to get away with last game, since you did have that B1 pick. Maybe not as possible this game. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Oh, no. Okay. That was a very powerful pick last game. I think there could have been other ways to deal with it, though, especially since you kind of picked the jinx into it, which I felt was a little... Mm, kind of an oof moment. Either way, they're just going to be taking that away. Two powerful comfort picks from that last time around. So a whole new rodeo this time around. If you happen to be in the mid or bot lane, at least. Yeah, when it comes to Tristana, taking her away in draft is just taking away a big flex pick. So your opponent can't play as many mind games. I think it's a strong ban as a reaction, but it's also just in general a strong ban for strategy. Lucia as well. This one I didn't expect to see in the first round of bans because it was banned second phase last time and Pawn Sacrifice Black already showed that they don't have as much of a priority in terms of getting their mid laner early. Mm -hmm. Could also be just in case if OC wants to make their mid laner early to help deal with any potential counter picks that might come out here from Pawn Sacrifice. That is going to be the question, though. Udyr is left up on the board, though, if they do want to yep. grab that. Already being hovered, wouldn't be surprised if it's locked in here. And that kind of begs the question, what do Pawn Sacrifice want to respond with? We did see how well that Lilio worked out last game for Lucia, and wouldn't be too surprised to see that again with Hecarim and Nunu. Yep. Taking those farm junglers, the ones that scale faster in the game can possibly be played. And since Pawn Sacrifice Black has two picks here, I would expect them to just get that jungle out of the way, keep up some potential picks for their other lanes that need the counter picks a little bit more. You pretty much guarantee that the Udyr is going into the jungle. Um, so I'd say just getting at least one of them here, uh, or at least the jungler here, Lilia, be a good example will be a nice answer, and possibly this time switching up to get that flex pick. Possibly even a Seraphine. Now they're just going to take away that Jinx for Mosu. Mm-hmm. Gonna be taking away that Jinx. Definitely fairly decent showing for the hunt for value on that last time around, especially with those uh, two early kills. They were able to snag, of course, as the game went on. There were some issues since being an immobile, eh, immobile AD carry against that Zed who hops on you every fight definitely hurts a little bit as the Brown being hovered right now 
is a strong pick into the Jinx since you're able to just hop in onto that Jinx off cooldown and there is no thrust to try and flay you away. We might see the Alistar, maybe even Morgana come out as a counter to this rel if um, Pawn Sacrifice really want to um, force a favorable bot matchup. Yeah, Morgana has been super strong to rel since some recent changes. Yesterday on the Risen stream, we saw it as a pick uh, against Aurel in uh, the Unstoppable League. So I would expect it to be somewhat of a priority. And since the uh, enemy jungler has already, or sorry, not jungler, the enemy support has already been chosen, I think this last draft, yeah, will be the final lock in for the bot lane for Pawn Sacrifice Black. And as you predicted, it is the Alistar. But now it's on to that second ban phase. What do you think we're going to see? Um. <laughs> Obviously, solo lane bans here. Um, yeah. Wouldn't be surprised if OCU decides to throw more bans towards two to max here in the mid lane, since two to max able to exert a lot of pressure last game. It's going to be that Renekt in which, if I recall correctly, in the top lane, Draco Phoenix was actually having a nice time into it. It was just a bit of interference from certain Lulia ganks that gave it a bit of hardship. Uh, Shen, I'm kind of confused about the Shen ban. I know the top laner for OSU plays it, but I don't think it's something that would be a super high priority for their team. Diana as well, uh, it was banned in the last game, perhaps uh, because of the mid laner of OSU. Providence Knox might have some sort of priority on that Diana. She's kind of a niche pick, can sometimes be useful, but isn't the most useful of mid laners. There are plenty of other options that can be played. Now it's onto that last ban. Will it be a ban onto to the max? Nope. Going to be yet another split push bruiser in the top lane getting banned out with the Camille. Well, let's see what Pawn Sacrifice want to lock in here because they will have to reveal one of their solo laners. Um, they can opt for a potential flex pick. I'm trying to remember who might be very strong flex picks between top and mid. And. All right, yeah, just kind of confirming it is going to be Polar Bear top. A very safe lock-in does tend to have some pretty decent matchups in the top lane, just due to um, how well you can trade, and then of course your uh, innate tankiness, letting you shark off a lot of potential punishment. Yeah, like, now the next two picks. This is going to finish off OSU's draft. I was about to mention, I was like, did Nar get nerfed in the most recent patch? Why isn't he getting picked? And I mean, he did sort of get nerfed, but instead it's going to be that Vladimir. A nice safe pick. Malphite as well is a little bit stranger. But I want to hear your thoughts on that. Just in a second, we're going to have this final pick first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the Malphite and the Volibear matchup is like, okay. I mean, we got two yeah. tanks just kind of slapping each other around. Eventually reaches a point where both are just like, okay, I kind of tickle you, you kind of tickle me. Wanted to just change grass procs and stuff. Yeah, sure. But the Vladimir, though, <laughs> is usually you see that Vladimir go towards the top lane and go towards the mid lane, but it's much more counter pick focus. Oh, Lord. Um, just due to the fact a lot of the long range mages in the mid lane can poke you out and give you a hard time before you have that max out of Q. And Cassiopeia will be able to go toe to toe for the most part of this Vladimir, if I recall the matchup correctly. Of course, the Cassiopeia can be burst out quite a bit by the Vlad herself, so it might be a little bit of a volatile matchup here. I'm feeling Cassiopeia a little bit. I'm definitely favoring Cassiopeia towards the later stages of the game. What is one common weakness between all of OSU's uh, engage and frontline? In order to do anything, they have to be looking at the opposing team to do actually anything. So Cassiopeia's ultimate will be a huge factor in uh, a counter engage or even just creating opportunities for Pawn Sacrifice Black to win out in later stages of the game. On top of that, she's actually pretty good at pressuring out of Vladimir in lane. He does have a ton of innate sustain since he doesn't use mana and has uh, life steal, or not exactly life steal, but vamp on his Q. So I think it's a strong pick. I think it's a safe pick. I don't think uh, she'll really have to worry about anybody uh, gap closing onto her super early into the game. I I'm a fan of this last one. Yeah, especially since the Vladimir, um, once he hits six, can of course time the Cassiopeia, but before then you don't really have the methods to outtrade the Cassiopeia, whose twin thing 
can just absolutely mow you down. And even after six, it can be a bit rough in the laning if we're not accounting for all ends. Just due to the fact that you don't have that transfusion Q next out yet, and that's really key for the Vladimir. To have that super low down Q to just continuously be slurp blood off the waves. Although currently Dragofi is suffering the Vlad size wondering it's gonna be a Malphite mid. Not gonna be the case here. Um, Malphite mid into Cassiopeia would be a little rough to say the least. Yeah, that would uh that would really hurt to watch. I would really hate to see that actually end up being the uh, matchup for OSU. If you want to draft a lane that has literally zero chance of winning, that's how you do it. But I again most likely if not definitely going to be vladimir versus cassiopeia they would be uh oh i don't i don't know what kind word i can say that would actually summarize how bad of a decision it would be to switch that up right crap pee pee poo poo so <laughs> yeah. going back to kindergarten with these plays i like it <laughs> Hey, you, you gotta make do, but this Vladimir, like you said, gonna have a hard time in that mid lane. Granted, though, once Providence Nox does hit that level 6, Vladimir's level 6 is just so notorious for how much burst he can put out, and he doesn't really have to worry about the Miasma in the sense that he's grounded, since he's able to just kind of run at you anyways and will get the move speed boost if he does take the ghost. Also, usually takes the phase rush, which gives him that slow resistance, so... To the, to the max is gonna have to be a little bit careful there. Doesn't have to worry too much about ganks, I feel. Just do the fact that the Pao Gamer on that Udir. Not that super flashy. You just kind of see him run at you at Mach 5, and you can drop the Miasma and really just down any aggression there. Of course, so it is still gonna be a very interesting thing to be watching here in the mid lane, I feel, to right Now, before we head into the break, heading into the Spectator delay, I need to ask you, Goferino. Do you have a prediction on who is going to win this match? Do you think it's going to go to a game three, or do you think this is going to be where PSB closes it out? If we see PSB able to exert like control over the map and just dictate the fights like we saw last time around, once we got to that mid game, then it should be very handily in their favor. Once again here, you do have the Cassie P and Jinx, who both scale insanely well and can just absolutely shred everyone on the enemy team. Of course, um, it's kind of hard to stop a Malphite just flying into your backline, and the Vladimir coming in behind too is also a threat. So there's an argument here for both sides, but if I'm looking at the play aspect, I feel like Pawn Sacrifice has the edge here. Pawn Sacrifice performed amazingly in that last game, so... We'll definitely have our eyes on them to see if they can continue that momentum and finish off this series strong and early. Before we head into game, though, we are going to go to that aforementioned short break. So we'll see you guys in just a minute for this game two of pre-made dominant with Risen Esports.
Welcome back, everyone, for game two of the best of three series between OSU Scarlet and Pawn Sacrifice Black. This time we're switching up the sides with Pawn Sacrifice Black. Taking on the red side of the rift for a simple fan to start out this game. Uh -huh. Oh, Lord. Yeah, nothing uh, too adventurous like last time around. Kind of makes sense. Neither of these teams really having that insane level one. I think the most we're going to see is maybe a duo or a tag team of people just going into the enemy jungle as a pair, trying to drop the deep ward and then just kind of backing off. Just get the early feel for your opponent in this game number two here, Terrain. Get the early feel, possibly spot out a potential uh, deep ward or even just spot out where the other team is going to be pathing for their jungle route. But when it comes to Udyr versus Lilia, all you can really expect for a, a jungle pathing is just kill everything in three minutes and then take scuttle crab and they're just going meet there uh -huh. they farm so darn fast yeah that's part of the reason why they're very meta right now <laughs> like that's literally the reason why udir came back so hard into the meta is he just he's able to fast. just power farm through the jungle contest scuttle with high health bar it's like, okay. mm, yep. and even after all the nerfs Still gonna be like that either way though we are in game see how it turns out here since this could potentially be the last game of the day foes who's not able to bring us to that game number three no i don't think we're going to see all too much action in the early game here just looking at pawn sacrifices black or, or on pawn sacrifice black it's hard to say out loud constantly but if you just look at their team comp, you see Cassiopeia and Jinx, not exactly the champions that are going to have some early game strengths. So you can already see them kind of sacrificing lane priority and be like, eh, yeah, we're not going to fight right now. We're not going to fight in a minute. We're going to fight in like 15 to 20 minutes. You guys have fun for the early game. Yeah, somewhat. I mean... Tuna Max actually as Cassiopeia can exert a lot of pressure early, maybe not so much since they did pick up the tier first tier instead of the more usual corrupting potion slash Torn's ring. Gonna of course help that Cassiopeia come online earlier just by finishing off that Seraphs earlier. And still, gonna be a little bit of calm mid lane unless Tuna Max wants to really go in ham. And interestingly enough, the full tank matchup here in the top lane it's actually the most heavy-handed so far here, Terrain. The yeah, heavy-handed Drago Phoenix is actually going to be caught in a pretty bad place right now. Having to burn the flash early, thanks to legit sack. Running early over to the Scuttle Crab as it spawns. I think Drago Phoenix wanted to get oh, that no ward in to try to push. Yeah, Bio Gamer's going to be able to get behind on Shrimp Tempura, but it's all on Daddy Zillion. He's a little too far up and not having the ability to escape. First Blood goes over the hunt for value, and a lot of gold onto the right target here, as she is the Kaisa. Mm-hmm, and it's gonna be giving this Kaisa a bit of prio in this lane here to get a free and easy back if they want to go back now. Of course, don't have to. Still have full health and nearly full mana on both hunt for value and Fluxetine. It does mean, though, quite the nice advantage uh, Bile Gamer has to be a little bit careful here after being spotted up at the ward. Of course, legit sack in the top lane, so it won't collapse, but still behind enemy lines, especially with mid pushed up like this, and you already saw Daddy Zillion there. Is that a uh, worrying potential for a collapse? Yeah, you can see that Lilia was spotted on a ward in the top side. So legit sack is going to walk in, try to steal away the camps from Udyr, as he they basically just transition to a vertical jungle at this point. But keep an eye on where the waves are for mostly the lanes of the red team. They have lane priority in all three lanes right now. Maybe top lane is even at the moment. But that really marks Biogamer to have to call himself back because every single lane can just collapse on him. So he is going to reset. His Lilia just finishes off his top side. And seems like Biogamer's just going to get in position for possibly an early dragon, if anything. Like, it's getting warded up right now from Daddy Zillion, but I don't really see him being able to do anything else. Maybe gank top, but he'll see that his jungle camps have been taken. He's just going to transition to getting some XP. 
Mm -hmm. And that does kind of suck for Drago Phoenix here being this low and under tower. Of course, Malphite, not the highest economy sort of top laner, but falling this far behind in the CS already just due to that early gank and some of that early pressure does suck quite a bit. Flash coming in. Two to max, getting knocked up, having a tough time escaping as the kill goes over to Providence Knox with the Tides of Blood. They'll open up the bot side of the map for a dragon take or even just another gank on the bot. Bio game yeah. walks in. Eddie Zillion. Gets the bear slap. That's actually troublesome TP. I think they can just turn on to this. Sheer Will is now in a very bad place. Does have the flash, but he's way too far up to do anything about mm. it. Third kill goes over to OSU and now full control over the bot side of the map. Oh, man, and uh, that is very unfortunate there for Sheer Will because you teleport in like, yeah, I'm going to save the homies, but you're level five Volibear TPing into like three enemies that can all just turn around and bop you immediately. Don't have the uh, Stormbringer to just pop on out there. Results in your death, the third kill over to the enemy team, and the first dragon going over to them. OSU once again claiming a nice little bit of an early lead objective wise this game, but also having a definitive lead in the kills department this time around too. Yeah, definitely a better start to the game for OSU and giving them a good momentum to get their team comp scaling ahead. They are the better team as far as their early game goes. So they want to be able to continue this into the mid game and try to close out the game as early as possible before to the max and uh, Shrimp Tempura can really take over the game in terms of damage. So far, Biogamer is doing an excellent job of positioning in the right places to get his team ahead, even allowing his top laner to get that wave shoved in, get some deep wards potentially spot out where Lilia will position as the Rift Herald is coming up soon. Mm -hmm. Let's see what these teams decide to do around that Rift Herald. It is always a nice early objective to pick up while the uh, tower plates are still up. The second Rift Herald, not, not exactly nearly as valuable, and it is a very volatile objective in the sense that there are a lot of times where you're just not able to get that maximum value out of it compared to just picking up a dragon which gives you its max value consistently every time you happen to get new stats. Yeah, I mean, the good thing is that, uh, or at least for OSU, the good thing is that they were able to get that drag early. Hold on to that thought, though, because two to max is getting engaged on. Yet another Realroam nets out positively for Providence Knox, a second kill to himself, soon to be the third as the Ignite ticks down on the cow and gets some stake onto that Providence Knox, Vladimir. Vladimir is starting to get very huge. You can already see the team rotating into the jungle and setting up for the next play. It's pretty spooky too. Uh, four and zero, or sorry, three and zero of Vladimir. Um, that is gonna be a royal pain in the butt to deal with because that Vladimir is just gonna run in and completely nuke legit to the max shrimp. And it, it, unless you stun him early, and lock him up before he's able to run into the back line and drop that pool, then you're going to have such a hard time dealing with this Vladimir pick that is coming out from Providence Knox. Yeah, you can't scale towards late game if you can't be alive. But Drago Phoenix in kind of a rough place is going to have the little thing lullaby onto him, but neither laner really wants to stay under this turret for too long. And Drago Phoenix is... We have to play the long game to survive this dive. Flashing to get some distance. I'm not sure if it was the best move. And Sheer Will is just going to close out that kill. The attempted Jinx Rock as well. Now in the bot lane, another fight going on as Daddy Zillion is a little to too max. far off. But two to max is on the backside. It will turn this around. Should it at least be a one for one as Flex is Bio going to Top of the hunt. Two to max is on the chase. Looking for Hunt off. for value, but now Biogamer has joined the fight. He's on to two, the max burn down from Phoenix form. Now onto Shrimp Tempura. I think it's just going to be a net kill. Net positive gain yet again. Two kills to Biogamer in a one fight to OSU. Yeah, and the Royal sucks because two to max was single digit seconds for 
the cooldown left on that ultimate. Had that been up, would have been able to probably finish off the hunt for value or be able to stop Biogamer from coming on in. Result though, all the same, it is going to be three kills for just that one in return on the bot side. And this Kaisa absolutely massive now. This Udyr has sprung up to such a influential point with this 301 scoreline that the trade for this Rift Herald on the top side is going to be nowhere near worth what you just lost on the bot side. Yeah, that's just so much gold value going over to so many members that really need it to push this team into a really good state of the game. Especially, normally you would want those kills onto the AD carry and sure, uh, the hunt for value to get some of them. But getting kills on a Biogamer, it's actually really good. You get momentum jungling to get the other lanes ahead as well. And you can even turn the tides of this top lane. It's currently super favored for sheer will. But when you have an Udyr that can just rip through everything and pressure the entire map, he can also help out top, get that Malphite back in the game. And even though he's so far behind in the top, Malphite's basically just a walking ultimate. You knock everybody up, get a good and strong engage, and... If you can get Biogamer to start snowballing that Malphite ahead as well, it'll be super strong. Now with the TP coming in from sheer will and a lilting lullaby onto two, we'll be in position around a dragon fight. That is a very key ultimate to get out, and it took the teleport of sheer will there as well, so that's a lot committed for a dragon. You're already just giving up quite a bit of. They're not even going to approach this, and I gotta be able even able to get a silver lining off the back of this might even get worse if they commit to this dive in the bot lane however terrain oh yeah there's the engage right there the miss on the unstoppable force but plenty of cc onto sheer will the damage onto the fluxatina sheer will gets the first kill of fight he clustered up his osu losing so far two members falling they didn't even get that much damage on to psb and props to Shrimp Tempura there. That was a very clutch timing on that flash there to dodge out of that unstoppable force from Drago Phoenix and to dodge out of the um, Magnet Storm from Fluxatine there. So that Jinx just able to get away free fire, even though it's not a full item Jinx yet, it still hurts a bit if you take all those repeated autos. You're also under the tower and you have everybody collapse on you. Those are two very big kills and if they're even able to get first tower off of this with that Rift Herald, that'd be such a massive swing back in their favor. It does not look like that's going to be the case, however, since this Vladimir for Providence Nox is going to have rotated down already. Yeah, Providence Nox wasn't in that last fight. That's so much gold of OSU's gold advantage that's just gone. And so in that clustered up team fight behind the turret without the Vladimir, they're effectively at two separate disadvantages. One, a turret. Two, the loss of a mid laner. Fox team wanted to make another to play down bot. We're actually getting a pause right now real quick before we continue into this. I'm not exactly sure what the pause is about quite yet, but we'll be able to update you guys as soon as possible once we know. Mm -hmm. But we are going to hop over to a quick intermission while this all gets sorted out so we can have everything hunky door on the production side. Don't go anywhere because we will be right back.
Hello everybody, welcome back. Sorry we had a little bit of production issues. The observer game crash, so we missed on a couple minutes. But to catch you guys up, Biogamer was able to secure his team three kills while one turret and a kill was secured by uh, PSB. On top of that, PSB was able to get a pick right before that dragon and picked up that ocean dragon to start their scaling. But now everybody's back up. Everybody's back on the rift. We're back to a little bit of a lull, a little bit of a calm down before we have the next fight. Mm-hmm. And that'll give us some extra time to talk here because if we look at the kill spread on both these teams on one side here for Pawn Sacrifice, definitely very even in how they've distributed their kills across the board. But on the other side, I mean, you have the lion's share of the kills onto Biogamer's full tank Udyr here, which... Well, definitely a blessing in the early game in terms of map influence does tend to fall off in value as the game goes on because you're just getting more and more beefy, but this Jinx will still shred through you eventually all the same. And hopefully this Vladimir, this Kaisa, can be able to pick up some more kills here for OSU to really hammer home just how big their carries can be. Yeah, that Rift Trail should help them get a little bit more... Uh gold onto those carries they have yet to oh my what? stolen what? by shrimp tempura with the super mega death rocket not too far across the map so that wasn't even the highest damage possible but now they're just going to be on duty to prevent the take so fun fact um jinx rocket does not actually need much time to hit the max damage the range of your zap aka the w is about roughly the same range it takes for it your super mega death rocket to hit the max amount. So, a little fun fact, I guess. Either way, though, yeah, it's uncapped against monsters now. And, uh, feels like Those that can happen. Monsters. Usually see it against barons and dragons, not so much the, uh, Rift Heralds. Jungle's gonna meet up here. Let's see what happens, because you have to watch he out is. for that. Hi. <laughs> Biogamer is the best. <laughs> Running yeah. straight away and out of there. Maybe could have looked yeah. like a pit, but. He is the fed member of his team. He has the finished pawn, so I'm not even sure he would have died if he got a lockdown on him. But as you were saying, Jinx Rocket is an execute. 30% missing health damage. Makes it pretty easy to steal those neutral objectives. And all it really does is deny the Rift Herald from uh, OSU. They, they were able to get it killed, but... I mean, nobody was able to pick it up, so sure, you get 25 gold from killing it, maybe some XP, but in the end, it's kind of just time burnt. Time burnt yeah. and survival for PSP. You'll definitely take it, though. It's a free steal there. Denies any um, objective momentum for the enemy team, because that Rift Herald would still be available to drop uh, when this next dragon came up, and you would have been able to force, well, do you want to respond to the Rift Herald, or do you want to contest the dragon here sort of deal? So, hey, stalling out the game when you have a Jinx cast CP, nothing to be uh, too worried about if you happen to be the Jinx Cassiopeia team, at least. Yeah, OSU is having a lot of struggle to break any sort of the uh, map objectives. Not so much neutral objectives, but they haven't got a single outer turret. And Totemax, or to the max, is getting slapped up right now from Udyr, but will run a little bit farther away, doesn't quite get the Petrifying Gaze, and Biogamer uses those six kills to his advantage and gets another kill for himself. And crucially, Matt. on the mid laner, the AP carry, setting up for a Baron. <laughs> Massive outplay there by just running at him Mach 5. <laughs> Force of Nature bonus move speed, definitely very appreciated there as, is that all in? Yeah, all in, three man pulverized, but nobody's there to follow up with the CC. Death Rock is lullaby. on to the carry, the sleep as well to get that first kill to fight. On to the hunt. Malphite. But now Malphite has joined the alt in, and everybody is so low from PSB. The Vladimir has finally showed up in one of these team fights, and he is doing work. Double kill for himself, looking for the triple onto Sheer Will. Bolly Bear is a little bit too tanky for that Vlad to burst through, but the rest of the team of PSB has already been annihilated from the Rift. But they do stop that Baron, and it was relatively even, all things considered, when you are a little bit on the back foot, and especially when you consider it is a 4 versus 5. Of course, with those uh, death timers, it does mean 
some of these members are gonna be a little bit late here to this dragon spawn whereas bow gamer and providence nox already here right on top of it able to just start it on up the instant teleport out from sheer will we'll have the calvary soon enough there's the cassio <laughs> pia bow gamer bio gamer doing foodier things just running at the cassiopeia as fast as possible but now providence nox is in a kind of weird place alistar even weirder sheer will is going to fall it's a trade one for one kill going to jinx kill on to vladimir but providence nox is going to fall super mega death rocket to finish off that kill for shrimp tempura and that's a big member down as the dragon is available here for psp to take the Udyr for Biogamer is still alive, does not have the flash to go over the wall, so not going to be able to contest that without the blast going. Going to be a second Ocean Dragon going over to the enemy team after they get two kills already. Hey, Zilli not going to be able to find anything off of that, but that is great momentum picked up, and a ping on the Baron, this might be a little too adventurous here. Keep in mind, there is an unstoppable force available. You do still have that super fed enemy Udyr, and these enemy team members are respawning <laughs> here. Now they are respawning, but Providence Knox is not going to make it to the Baron in time whatsoever. Perhaps the Baron was more of a bait to try and get people in, or more of one of those plays where you're just like, this is so stupid, they would never expect us to do this. If Biogamer reads the positioning, is onto two to max. Walks a team joining the ultimate engage onto the Cassiopeia isn't going to work out. But if Biogamer is low, the unstoppable force misses out on everybody yet again. Bio gamers going to get on out of there, but I can't say the same about Drago Phoenix. Providence Knox answers back in a kill, but there are so many members of PSB still available to make this fight happen. This it's super mega death up. rocket blind onto the jungler, and with four members down of OSU, this will surely be the Baron going over to PSB. Oh my lord, and they're able to just win the fight right off the back of it once again. Beautiful just dodging and diving around that mouth by ultimate drago phoenix has not been able to land a big ult so far this game and it's been costing them here terrain now it's going to result in the enemy team gang the bear and this jinx now six two and six this is absolutely massive this is in the very spooky zone yeah the you know how i said earlier that malphite's basically just an ultimate free cc and a knock up to land onto people very easily well when you don't hit anybody with your ultimate now you're only a health bar and he doesn't even have that much health to begin with he's only sitting at one completed item right now he has some resistances but it's not at the point of the game where those resistances are going to prevent them from just tanking up an entire force he died with basically not doing anything in that last fight and the rest of his team was just trying to get away with the scraps of life that they had. Biogamer was out early on because he got picked off, sort of. He was the one trying to make the pick, but it didn't work out. As well, the support of Fluxatine, Ari had used his engage without anybody really there to follow up with the damage. So everything just goes the way of PSB. They may be missing one Baron buff onto legit sack, but now it's onto them to try to make a play to get the gold value even higher from this Baron. Yeah, because there's nothing else really to do on the map except for try and shove in these turrets as there's a big fight in the bot lane, Sheer Will. It's going to be rough to escape this for Sheer Will, but he has an entire yeah. team very easily able to rotate over, just walk it down. He's a very tanky bear, and uh, the opposing team's bear doesn't really do all that much damage to tanks. So... Just a lot of resources, not too many resources I have actually used to try to get that kill bot. Because of the positioning to try to get uh, Sheer Will, rest of PSP is going to be in the mid lane. Take that out that inner turret, try to break open the base. The first inhibitor turret is exposed and ready to be hit. Keep in mind, like, with this Baron buff, if Shrimp and Poor gets close to these turrets, and by close I mean like, 750 auto attack range. Gets knocked fight. away. Here's the engage though. Unstoppable force only lands onto the Jinx. Prince of Rel is already very low. Taken out by legit sack with the swirl seed. But two down from Jinx. Shrimp Timper is ripping apart the opposing team. He may fall to Udyr. But the damage has already been done. And the ace has been secured here for PSB. They still have the Baron. They still have their Cassiopeia. I think they'll be able to close out this game with the death timer still at about 30 seconds. It's 
still. It was a close-ish fight for OSU, but I think this is likely going to be either the end of the series or the opening up of the Nexus. It's going to definitely be very close. We can see less than 10 seconds. Even Flux is seen already back up. That's one of these Nexus turrets down. And looks like they're just going to be backing off here. They did lose their Baron buff there. So you don't have those super minions or sorry, super buffed up minions, not super minions quite yet to really help you tank and tread through those turrets. But taking down one of those Nexus turrets, cracking open an inhibitor that is going to be quite the boon here let's see if they're going to be able to get through file gamers they do have a cassiopeia you get cassiopeia landing too with the petrifying gaze it's already going to be the falling of bio gamer Spuxatine is likely to follow and providence Knox not able to get the damage off to find a kill quite yet but sheer will is getting very low and the hunt for value has found the value of that kill sheer will has been taken out Plays on with Lothing Lullaby. There's a Super Mega Death Rock with two man unstoppable force. Providence Knox has some damage, but Shrimp Temper has even more. That Jinx has shut down the entire enemy team. A second ace to come through. And with Super Minions already onto that final Nexus turret, now is the time that they should close out the game. <laughs> it has to be, especially now that it's this Jinx hopping onto these turrets. Okay, any day now. It's out of the turret here, buddy. There you go. You've got an Udyr, a super fed Udyr coming up in three seconds. Finish the game. This is, oh my God, fuck the team with the flash. This is game over. PSB goes 2-0 in this best of three series. Wins it out, improving their stats to five and three in the regular season. And that definitely was a much closer game too there, but they're able to pull it back together eventually. Start controlling the fights again, round those objectives once again, and just get all these kills continuously pumped into Shrimp Tempura here, Terrain. And 9, 3, and 11, that is one scary, scary jinx. Yeah, that jinx ended up becoming a pretty much a monster in the later stages of the game. But the big turning point was that team fight that we were actually able to see down uh, in the bot lane when it was a little bit too aggressive and engaged behind that hour turret. Once that fight was lost uh, from OSU Scarlet, they didn't really have any high momentum plays throughout the rest of the game. That just killed their pacing and gave a ton of gold over to the opposing roster. I, I think that they could have pulled out that game win if they didn't make that over-aggressive play without so much of their gold missing with Providence Knox not there. Mm -hmm. Of course, so what has passed has passed, and you can't really fix that at this point. Um so the results are still all the same. Congrats, though, to Pawn Sacrifice for being able to pick up the 2-0 here, advance themselves to that 5-3 spot. Congrats, and though, with only two weeks left in the regular season, that is a strong point to be in. Yep. Well, they may not be undefeated. They do improve past the score of their uh, matching, uh, more or less, score counterpart. It was four and three for both these teams to start off the today, but with that game, I already said it five and three for Pawn Sacrifice Black, whereas uh, OSU Scarlet is going to move down to uh, four and four, be a little bit lower on uh, their score spectrum. So it's very important to secure that higher seed in these uh, regular season games, and I would love to uh, see how. Pawn Sacrifice Black carries us on to perhaps some of the more difficult opponents within their bracket. Yep. But with that being said, though, um, I believe it is time for us to wrap up the broadcast. Uh, shout outs to Tyrell for being the streamer today. And thank you to all our viewers for coming on out. Thank you, everybody, for watching. On behalf of myself and everybody else on the rest of the broadcast team, we'll see you guys next time for more Risen esports action.